the imbalance is also greatest in the elite institutions, the ones that have the most impact on the national conversation. I was at the Harvard Political Science Department for years had one open Republican, one guy who just got tenure, then came out of the closet, so now we have two. But I think that's a problem. It means that, that this, the undergraduates and the professors themselves are limited in the range of ideas they're exposed to. And a lot of times that leads them to really misunderstand the, how the real world operates. Let me bring, bring it over here. It, it reminds me when I, when I talk to uh, people in the press, they are convinced people working in the mainstream media do not have a left to center bent. Even though you find out during, for instance, the uh, uh, last election, 90% of the Washington press corps voted for Obama. When you take a look at the CNBC, it was MSNBC did a study of political contributions from reporters, and it was you know massively over to the other side of the. But no, I, we're we are balanced. And I think if you went to any university and you asked them, well, are you balanced? They think they are, but objectively. They're not. Why is it that liberals are drawn to this type of work than, than something else? Well, I think there's a couple things. Having graduated from CU's journalism program, where my professors openly called me the Republican, <laughs> I can speak to this uh, relationship with the press. But that being said, I think we need to be very Ma clear imagine, in this. Imagine if they called you, you know, the gay or the lesbian <laughs> right, or, right. or I, something I'd love else. It. Or, I'd love it because then yeah. I would be something other than she's this religious right wing nut who hates everybody. <laughs> but if they identified you I'd as. I get scholarship. Yeah. If, if they identified you as the lesbian, well, then you'd have a lawsuit on your but hand. But this brings me to the second point, and that I think this needs to be something that um, really is part of the framework of every conversation we have about ideological imbalance, and it is this that conservatives who are in extremely liberal environments, or vice versa, liberals that are at those few conservative public public institutions in this country would be very the military <laughs> military thank yeah. you uh, th it would be a problem it would be a disservice to them mm -hmm. if they considered themselves a victim mm -hmm. of the system i believe and i can say this with 100% of my soul that my experience at CU the education i got was so much better because i was challenged in a way that liberal students weren't and i am not one of these people who believes that we should have quotas for conservatives mm -hmm. because having gone to college for nine years, three degrees and four fellowships later, I find that, you know, looking at the uh, entire experience, that some of my best professors who challenged me the most were those, including one who was a, a, a self-described communist, and others that were so far left that we would never vote for a single issue together on a November ballot, and yet there was this respect. So to me, it's more about having respect for ideas, and the way we need the, to get back to that. The difference between you and most people is that you're a very strong-willed woman. You're not going to get pushed around in a class. You want a good fight. I think there are a lot of students out there who are just trying to get through who are marginal students who <laughs> just need to to write things on the palm of their hand in order to, right. to get through a test but even and, then but, the and vast for there, majority of if professors, i know if i know that my professor is is a wild liberal am i going to challenge him the way that an a student like you would i i wouldn't well in those classrooms uh where i'm talking about those liberals that were most helpful uh, or most supportive of me developing my ideological framework they weren't the kind of professors who shot down ideas or silenced students or made students feel they couldn't speak up. These are the professors, and I think they are in the majority of classrooms, not the vast majority and certainly not in enough classrooms, but they see it as their obligation to present all sides, or at least all relevant but, sides of an argument. But why aren't there more conservatives, this is a simple question, why aren't uh, there, there more are, conservatives, there are, more libertarians mm -hmm. in higher ed teaching? There are three key reasons. I think first off, the left has always, to some degree, worshiped the state because who will run the state? People with advanced degrees like us will. So it's sort of in our interest. Uh, a secondary reason, though, is more of a sociological reason, which is that think about what you have to do to get a PhD. You have to go a 1,000 miles away from your home and family and pursue this degree for six, seven, eight. Increasingly, now the mean is nine to 10 years, probably delay having children, delay getting married for that long. Um, frankly, liberals care Liberals and conservatives have equally good GPAs, which for one thing suggests to me that they're equally smart and the professors probably aren't that biased in most cases. But liberals are more likely to say, all right, I'll put off having a family for 10 years. I'll move far away from home to pursue this dream. 
conservatives value their families more. They value their relationships more. They want to have kids more. They're less willing to, to pay that price. That is part of the reason. There are additional reasons, but too. But isn't the same thing There's, true well, in, in any career well, that as you're you building your price, career, sure. you're paying a price, you're going to be on the road a lot, a, you're going to be away from your family? It's a much bigger price. You, most careers, you don't have to move away for 10 years. There's something else, too, that goes along with this, though. It isn't all just personal choice. We have a lot of very good data in the book. Academia is largely a merit system. If you publish more, you get better jobs. You know, why do I have the job I have? Well, 10 books and lots of articles. That's why I have it. The, uh, but within that, your ideology also plays a role. Uh, it looks to us from the data here that, that, that publication is the number one predictor of where you end up, but social conservatism also has a pretty strong impact, equal to about a third of the impact of publication. And that makes sense because the way academia is now, for the last 30 years, the job market's been terrible. You have an opening, you'll have 50 or 100 or sometimes 200 good applicants applying. When a committee faces that, they naturally pick people just like themselves. And the danger of that is, We've gone, I think, from hiring peers to hiring clones. So the university started out being sort of left wing and moved steadily leftward over the last 40 years. And that's what but I think is a danger. But isn't that completely antithetical to what liberals to say what they, yes. they believe? Yes. The diversity factor that you know, we're here to, to, to give them a rich environment with yes. different ideas. And so let's populate it just with people like us. All right. And that's the so argument I, we make again and again and here, that universities themselves would have more respect from society and would function better if we had more They don't need ideological respect diversity. from society because they need respect from lawmakers who funnel money to them. They're not in the free market. Go to University of Phoenix, go to Everett College, go to all the working colleges out there. They survive in the free market. These colleges that you talk about, government-sponsored colleges, they understand a different rent-seeking reality than the rest of us do. I see a direct correlation between our current funding structure uh, for our universities and the ideological corruption or the disregard for a vi vigorous debate on our campuses. And let me explain. In Colorado, every day almost these days during the legislative session, we see these articles about higher, how higher ed is uh, underfunded. And yet what we don't hear about is the fact that the university is spending $200,000 a year to fund a diversity chancellor. Uh, a person whose duty is to make a more inclusive campus. Well, how do you make a campus more inclusive if you're raising tuition for the poorest students? It just doesn't make sense. Now, uh, how this translates into programming that we have is this. We don't have an appropriate market response, and we have radical faculty members who say, we need to have a women's studies department. We need to have a black studies department. We need an Asian studies department. We need an LGBT. LGBT studies department. And under all of these departments, there is an artificially mandated demand because students are required to take diversity coursework as part of the, the part of the graduation requirements. What's interesting though is So they not only not only do they mm -hmm. um, there's no market interaction or response to mm -hmm. these institutions because we have a limitless pot of student loans and the government knows students will continue to take mm -hmm. out and these and loans. Now that the feds have taken over the banking institution for student loans, it'll just keep going more and more. All right. I, I actually think the, the women's studies departments, African American studies departments and others. I went to the I, women's studies department. Not what I thought it was going to be at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, there, there are some people doing good work there. That was there. good. I mean, Thank it's, you. That was beautiful. In, in general, those are fields that don't really have a theoretical core. And what's interesting is most academics are not wild about them. You very rarely have someone from those departments become, say, dean or chancellor. And in that way, they're kind of like conservatives. They're kind of marginalized within the university. Um, I, I actually think that the biggest problem with this in some ways, and most faculty, certainly in my field, we actually have good studies of this, make some effort to be fair to their students, uh, even their conservative students. I think the even bigger, them. Yeah, even them, even them. I think the, the bigger problem, as I see it, is first of all, faculty themselves don't understand conservative thought and so often don't portray it accurately. But more yeah, than that. Yeah, yeah think? Yeah, yeah, but, but more than that, there are a lot of social problems that we really could be solving. Let me give a, a real obvious example. Back in the 1980s and early 90s, criminal justice professors and sociology professors argued that in the 90s, crime in New York City would, would increase for demographic reasons. Instead, crime cratered over a 15-year period. We had a sustained 80-some percent reduction in homicides because of essentially more conservative policing policies. And the ideological gurus were actually a, a conservative political scientist, James Q. Wilson, and a conservative criminal justice professor, George Kelling. Now, guess what? 
no one in graduate sociology or political science or, or, or public administration programs teaches those methods. Nobody studies it. Nobody copies it. It would be as if we found a cure for 80% of cancers and medical schools refuse to recognize it. 